It's time to look at brain rule number two, manage it. First, let's look at how to tame that stress response, how to stay cool under pressure and make effective decisions when it counts. The brain is hardwired to minimise danger but maximise reward. First and first priority is to minimise danger. If danger is present, then what we do is invoke the fight or flight response. The fight or flight response has three characteristics for the brain. We become pessimistic, we overgeneralise and we become emotional. On top of that, we lose brain cells. So if brain cell death, pessimism, overgeneralisation and emotionality are what you're after, you should invoke the stress response. Unfortunately, at least where I work and I expect where you work as well, it's no longer appropriate to run away from work when you get stressed out or hurt your boss. In fact, there's a law against it in this country. Luckily enough, we can invoke what we call the Barrow Reflex. The Barrow Reflex is a simple relationship between how we breathe and whether or not we're stressed out. If you've done meditation at any time in your life, you would have invoked the Barrow Reflex. Simply put, breathing slowly and deeply means that we can't have a stress or fight or flight response at the same time. It's not possible. How do you invoke the Barrow Reflex? The brain and the body are inextricably linked. If you breathe slowly and deeply, then you will invoke the Barrow Reflex, which turns off the stress response. The key to staying cool under pressure and making effective decisions in what would otherwise be a stressful environment is to take control of the amygdala, the stress response, and tame it with the prefrontal cortex. We do that with deep, slow breathing, the barrow reflex, and go into a situation where you need to control your stress. It might be a meeting, it might be talking with a loved one, it might be meeting your boss, it might be dealing with clients, making that next sales call. If you go in in that condition, then the front, the prefrontal cortex of your brain is in control. The logical, rational part of your brain has tamed that emotional wild horse. That one that wants to be pessimistic, it wants to overgeneralize, it wants to be emotional, and it will kill your brain cells. Another key to performing under pressure is to single task. Concentrate on doing one thing at a time. The brain just doesn't deal well with multitasking. Let me tell you about a study that's just come out which changes everything. In this study, people worked on computers in one condition and single task. In another condition, they did the same task but had distractions such as email, chat and mobile phones. In the multitasking condition, people were 50% slower and made 50% more mistakes. Here's the big news folks, the people that rated themselves as the best multitaskers turned out to be the worst multitaskers. Humans perform badly when they have multiple information channels. Multitasking just doesn't work for us. How can you simplify your life to work faster, more effectively and more productively? Well, here's a couple of ideas that I've used in my life to simplify it to get down to single tasking and doing important things. The first thing that in my life is what I call a work-like activity that gets in the way as a multiple information channel for me is email. I was getting about 150 emails a day. They were coming from left, right and centre and not all of them were relevant but they distracted me. Lights on in the car park. Who wants to buy chocolates? There's free this at lunchtime. Someone's giving in a seminar on something random that I've never heard of. I needed to simplify my life. This is what I did. I sent out an auto reply about six months ago that went something like this. Thank you for your email. I'm now redefining the main tasks in my day. Brackets. These are currently responding to and mainly deleting emails. If there's anything urgent, please call my cell phone. 
Otherwise, I'll be checking my email at the end of the day. Thank you for your patience, and I hope this inspires you to turn your email off once in a while. How do you think I felt? Well, the first morning, as a serial email procrastinator, that's what I said, procrastinator, someone who sits there and fiddles with stuff but achieves not much, I felt incredibly anxious. What would I do? Did my cell phone start ringing? No. Did my staff solve, start solving problems on their own? Yes. Was I able to do other tasks? Yes. I was all of a sudden able to simplify single task and do important things. How do you know something's important? You know something's important when it's out of your comfort zone. Email, for the most part, was not out of my comfort zone. This strategy helped me with my second work-like activity, which in my organisation happens to be meetings. Meetings are quite good fun, as it turns out. My friends come along, and even sometimes we have free food. Occasionally there's an action list and we have to do stuff, but mostly we just have a good time. That's great, unless you want to get something done. Removing that clutter, email and meetings has allowed me to single task, achieve twice the amount in half the time. The result is you have more time to think, you have more time to do other things. Simplifying, removing the multitasking is the way to go for productivity, it's the way to go for satisfaction, and it's the way to go for peak performance and achieving things. Okay, so brain rule number two is manage it. Your brain, that is. So far, we've learned how to manage our brain by deep breathing, single tasking, and doing important things. But how do we manage our brain to get on well with others? Neuroscience has uncovered some really interesting stuff about emotions. When we're having an emotional, particularly a stressful response, what we now know is the amygdala will actually send out chemicals that block signals from the rational prefrontal cortex. These chemicals last about a quarter of a second, which if you don't do something in that quarter of a second, you can get taken away by the wild horse that is your emotional brain. Neuroscience has shown us that if we do something as simple as take a breath, that buys us the time, but then if we express our emotions by using the words, I feel stressed, or I feel angry or upset, what actually happens is you strongly activate the prefrontal cortex and reduce the intensity of the amygdala, and therefore you reduce the intensity of the emotion. What neuroscience has also showed us is that those people who reappraise or reframe their situation actually do much better on life mastery and satisfaction and happiness. What I mean by reframing is trying to find the silver lining in the dark cloud, taking a different sense of perspective and trying to find the good that will come out of a bad situation, such as this will make me stronger or I will learn lessons, anything like that. When talking about emotions, there's another psychology experiment that neuroscience has recently uncovered the reasons for. This is called the ultimatum game. It goes something like this. I have $100, but in order to keep some of it, I need to agree with you a split. If you say yes, you get some and I get some. If you say no, nobody gets anything. Why would anybody say no? Well, in experiments, it looks something like this. If I offer 50, 100% of people take it. If I offer 30, about 80% of people take it. If I offer 20, it drops down to about 50%. If I offer 10, less than 20% of people will say yes. 
But if I'm a computer, more than double that will say yes. What does this mean? Why would we say no if we're getting something for nothing? It turns out that it's something to do with fairness. And this is what we call a social meme. It is something that is inbuilt into us to punish people for being unfair. Chimpanzees do the same thing. What is routinely shown in this experiment is that people whose area of the brain that called the insula is sensitive, they are the people who refuse the money. They are the people who have a strong sense of fairness and they will actually bite their nose off to spite their face in order to punish you. They will forgo something or sacrifice something in order to punish somebody who is being unfair. This has important repercussions for getting along with people and especially if you're a leader. It's not what you say to someone it's how you make them feel. If they feel that you're being unfair, often they will sabotage or punish you. Getting along with others is all about how we make people feel. But how do you get people to come along with you? Let's look at a technique. Let's talk about getting along with others and managing others. I want to talk about motivational interviewing the technique that helps you work with other people, get along with them, and get them coming along with you. The basic rule here is if I tell you to do something, you probably won't. But if you tell me you're going to do it, you probably will. Let's just say that again. If you tell them to do it, they probably won't. If they tell you, they probably will. And this comes from Really one of the first leadership books, the classic leadership book to look at this was How to Win Friends and Influence People. This book came out in the 1950s and the basic thesis of the book was people are self-interested. Let's put that another way. They really want to show you their holiday photos but they don't want to look at yours. Let's just say that again. People want to show you all show off their holiday photos, but they don't want it to look at yours. Let's put that in practical working terms, which is what one of the most powerful techniques that psychologists use called motivational interviewing. Motivational interviewing is a powerful tool used by psychologists to get people to do things. You too can use this. The principles of motiva motivational interviewing are very simple. Let's talk about them now. Principle one, you shut up, let them talk. We're talking about a 70-30 rule at least. They talk 70% of the time, you 30%, hopefully less. You ask open-ended questions, you let them answer, don't butt in. You reflect on what they've told you, rather than offering your opinion. What you're trying to do is offer a way where people can talk themselves into what you both want them to do. I experience this a lot when I talk to people about losing weight. It's all good and well me coming in and going, do this, do that, eat this, that, and the other healthy thing, and avoid this, that, and the other yummy thing. But what I need them to do is come to me and say, I want to do this because, and here's how I propose the solution. And I will help guide them to that. This is a tremendously powerful way of engaging people and getting behavior change. Let's go back to that original rule. If I tell you to do it, you probably won't. If you tell me, I probably will. Motivational interviewing is the way to this.